All right, hey everybody. Um, so today I want to talk to you a little bit about um, how fast lithium-ion batteries work. Uh, I work in the chemistry department. I uh, started in September, and I'm working with Professor Claire Gray. Uh, so a little bit about battery basics. Uh, I like to introduce this in context sort of of your uh, cell phone, something everybody thinks pretty familiar with. So as you're using your device after it's fully charged, um, you basically have, these are, these are all, all the devices you are currently using, your phone, your laptop, these are all um, lithium cobalt oxide batteries. So the lithium has a tendency to want to be in the cobalt, uh, which is the cathode. It does not want to be in the graphite, uh, like um, carbon structure, which is used as the anode. So when it's fully charged, all of the lithium ions sit in that graphite where it doesn't want to be. The energy you get out is the thermodynamic energy just of those lithiums uh, moving into the layered structure on the right uh, of the cobalt oxide layers. So uh, we force the electrons to go through, uh, to not go through the electrolytes, so we put a separator here, force them to go through your device, thus giving you the power that you get. And then um, they meet back up with the electron, or the lithium in the uh, electrolyte to go into the layers. So you have your electron go through the circuit and the lithium go through uh, a separator in the middle. Uh, as this happens then, you can see the reactions on the left, as this happens, uh, the charge in your battery goes down. Once all of the, uh, the cobalt oxide is holding as many lithium atoms as it can, um, it turns out to be one lithium per cobalt, so the cobalt's reduced um, from cobalt-4 to cobalt-3. And as this happens, uh, once it's fully reduced, then your battery is, to you, just dead. Um, what it really means is that... Uh, like I said, that that cobalt oxide structure is fully lithiated. So then you have to put power in, charge your phone, uh, to send all those electrons back the other direction and pull the lithium out into these graphite carbon layers where they don't really want to be, which is why you have to put energy in to get them there. Uh, so rather than cobalt oxide, I work with niobium oxide. Um, so this NB205 you see here. Um, but you can tell it's essentially the same reaction going in both directions. I'm just lithiating. Um, one lithium per niobium atom, so taking it from niobium-5 uh, to niobium-4. Um, this is sort of the setup of my uh, simple coin cells that I make, um, where you have the black is the niobium oxide cathode, and then a little separator, and then some lithium metal as the anode, um, so that I can have this reaction. Niobium oxide, uh, looks like the uh, slide's got a bit messed up, but niobium oxide actually has several different crystal structures. Uh, so these are just different arrangements of uh, these NB205 atoms. You have this layered structure. Um, you have a rather closed uh, structure known as the B phase. And then you have a structure that has 1D channels, but not the two-dimensional layers uh, that you see in this T phase. I also took some scanning electron microscopy images of these, uh, which I think are sort of nice to visualize what the, the different ones look at. So I sh I've shown you here the T and the H phase, just at different magnifications. Uh, in the T, you can see that it's not very well crystallized. Uh, they're small, broken, fragmented particles. Um, because it is uh, sort of synthesized at a lower temperature than the H phase, um, that's the high temperature stable phase, where you have these more nice, well-formed crystals with striations um, and this monoclinic crystal habit. Uh, if we start to look at the electrochemistry uh, of these different ones, you see the B phase, which I said was pretty closed. Um, shows a very poor ability to hold charge. So this capacity axis is just charge. It's how much, uh, how many electrons um, that structure will hold. Uh, so if we look, the, the T and the TT you can think of is just very, very similar. Um, but you can see those versus the H, they don't hold quite as much charge, so they don't go out as far. But you can also see that the mechanism of charge entering the structure is quite different. So in the H phase, as charge goes in, it hits a plateau. Uh, this y-axis here is potential. Um, and so the potential sort of stays constant as we keep putting, electro or keep putting electrons and lithium into the H uh, structure. What that means when you have a plateau is essentially that uh, you have a two-phase reaction where every lithium you put in is at the same energy. That just means maybe there's this many sites in that niobium oxide structure, but every site takes a lithium with the same amount of energy. In the T and the TT phase, that's not what you observe. So you observe a linear dependence of potential and charge. Uh, that means every lithium that goes in actually gives you a little bit less energy, um, which indicates like a, what they call a solid state, uh, a solid solution reaction, um, which is actually this curve looks a bit more like a capacitor than it does look like a battery. 
Um, so it takes all of the lithium in at different, different times. Um, so we also looked at a rate test. So as you noticed earlier, the, the H phase that I showed hold, held a little bit more charge. But if you do it at faster rates, so these are just um, the bigger the number here, 10 is a faster rate. So at the fast rates, the T and the TT phase still perform pretty well, um, whereas the H phase actually drops off very rapidly to almost no charge when you try and cycle your battery quickly. Um, so if you wanted to charge it back up quickly. And that's the advantage of the T and the TT phase that I've shown. These things can sort of recharge in as low as 60 seconds. Um, so rather than plugging your phone in for two hours, you could plug it in for 60 seconds and have a full battery charge, um, which are the advantages. Uh, we study this with solid state nuclear magnetic resonance, um, which essentially we can look individually at uh, the lithium atoms, the oxygen atoms, the niobium atoms that are present. Um, and rather than x-ray diffraction, which looks at long range structure, um, we can look at sort of individual um, structure of these atoms. Uh, just finish up quickly here. So we have to do a few enhancements to do solid state NMR because, so here I've shown a picture of caffeine and in solution state you get these really nice um, sharp peaks but when you do solid state NMR because you have uh, anisotropy because things aren't spinning in, in rapidly in solution you get quite broad peaks. So we, we spin the samples actually to get better resolution. Uh, quickly going through this, so I, I show here some lithium NMR that we took on this magnet. Um, and you can see that there's different, when we, when we deconvolute the black uh, overall peak, you can see that there's different lithium environments present. These correspond to things like the electrolyte and Li2O on the surface and lithium intercalated into the bulk. And the same thing with oxygen, except that oxygen, um, the peaks are very, very broad and much harder to deconvolute or deal with, even though we're spinning this at 60,000 rotations a second in an extremely strong magnet. Um, it's still quite difficult to deconvolute and we use um, some calculations actually to figure out what these different phases are. So with that, I would like to thank the people that I work with and all of you for listening to my talk. <laughs> Questions? Yep. Yeah, presumably the ions are somewhat rarer and more expensive than cobalt. Is it viable to make batteries from it? Uh, so in terms of um, Rarity, it's, it's a little bit more rare than cobalt, but it has actually less toxic properties. So there are some advantages and some disadvantages. Um, with batteries, you consider sort of different uses. So niobium oxide isn't something that you'd ever find in your car or in a grid storage type um, energy system. But if you were using it for sort of a, a high powered, um, rapid charging electronic device, it could very become, very well become worthwhile. So it depends on the scale of batteries you make. When people want to make things for cars, they don't look at things as expensive as niobium. But for your cell phone, it may very well be worth for you to pay 50% more than what you pay for your battery now to charge it in 60 seconds. So it's, it's more of a viable option at that point. Yep. Um, how many times can you cycle these batteries? And then how does that compare to, say, typical batteries that we have on our phones? Or right. right. Uh, good, uh, good question. question. So I, I haven't shown the slide here, but actually we do cycle tests on these where we cycle them repeatedly for many cycles. Uh, and because the, the T phase that I showed, the one that, the one that cycles very fast, um, because it is a solid solution reaction, uh, there's actually very, very little phase change that occurs through that. The cell sort of, the cell lattice expands very slightly, only 3%, which is very small in terms of these battery materials, and then closes back up when you take the lithium in and out. So this actually performs much better than a standard battery, much better than cobalt oxide um, on long-term cycling. The H phase that you saw with that, with that phase change will go, will go down over 100 cycles. It loses about 20%. The T phase loses 0% over 100 cycles. It, it holds exactly the same charge. So um, you, know, you, could, you, could, uh, you definitely don't want to extrapolate and just say, oh, it does the same thing at 1,000 cycles. But we're running further tests. At 100 cycles, it loses zero amount of its capacity. That's all. Okay. Thank you.